literature. So let's have a look now at the poem A Heart Frost by Cecil Day Lewis. A frost came in the night and stole my world and left this changeling for it. A precocious image of spring, too brilliant to be true. White lilac on the window pane, each grass blade furred like a catkin, maydrift loading the hedge. The elms behind the house are elms no longer, but blossomers in crystal, stems of the mist that hangs yet in the valley below, amorphous as the blind tissue whence creation formed. The sun looks out, and the fields blaze with diamonds. Mockery spring, to lend this bridal gear for a few hours to a raw country maid, then leave her all disconsolate with old fairings of aconite and snowdrop. No, not here, amid this flounce and filigree of death, is the real transformation seen in progress. But deep below, where frost, worrying the stiff clods, unclenches their grip on the seed and lets the future breeze. There's also the use of alliteration. And the alliteration of flounce and filigree in line 15 suggests the disapproving tone of the speaker. So we've looked at the various different tools and the different devices that the poet has used to create this poem. Let's have a look now at some themes, two major themes. First one, appearance versus reality. You see, when he looks out of his window, the beauty of the frost is there, but he knows it is deceptive because it can also be destructive and life-threatening. However, given the right conditions, it can also facilitate a new beginning under the surface, as he talks about the clod releasing its grip on the seeds. And then we look at the second theme of personal growth and development. You see, this scene is a metaphor for quiet, personal growth that people undergo in adversity. Much of what we see as beautiful and worthy is actually an illusion. And truly important things in life are often things that are unseen and unappreciated. Think about that one. Tone and mood. Well, the mood is contemplative which, and introspective. It means that the, the tone is such that it causes you to think, to contemplate, to wonder, to ponder. And introspective means inward looking. The tone, hmm, it starts off distrustful, dismissive, uneasy, disapproving, and then becomes positive and satisfactory. Now, the distrust is created by the image of the changeling, which looks attractive, but which is too good to be true. The dismissive tone is evident in the knowledge that the beauty of the frost is not lasting. The description of the mist makes a poet feel mm, uncomfortable and uneasy as he does not know what is hidden in it. And it talks about the blind mist. And in lines 11 to 14, the tone becomes disapproving as the frost is indicative of a mockery of a raw country maid and into thinking that beauty has been given to her but will disappear and leave her disappointed and upset. The ending is more emphatic with a positive tone at the realization of where the real change in nature is actually happening. And the last line has a satisfactory tone as he realizes that real change and transformation happens unseen. Now, as we've already said, a hard frost occurs when temperatures drop below freezing and everything is coated in crystals overnight. And this is very beautiful, but also damaging to plants. The most prominent imagery created was snow. For example, brilliant, white, diamonds, bridal gear. Things used to describe the hard frost are beautiful, shiny and bright. Now, these were used to portray a beautiful scene of white snow spreading all over the forest. Usually, the forest in winter gave people a sense of cruelty, harshness and lifeless. But after having a white frost coating on the dead trees and mountains, 
everything seemed to come glamorous and attractive. The imagery suggests spring flowers and the freshness of new growth, such as maydrift loading the hedge, or blossomers in crystal. And despite the glittering beauty, from the outset, the speaker points out that this is actually deceiving, and he accuses the frost of theft, as it has stolen away and the expected scene and replaced it with a fake. And the frost is given almost magical, mystical powers in its ability to accomplish this transformation. Now, the personification of the last two lines creates an image of a contest of strength taking place beneath the ground where the earth is surrendering its frozen hold on the power of spring, and this allows the seeds the chance to sprout, grow, and break out of the soil to promise future life and growth. So, let's have a look, shall we, at some of the questions that you can expect to encounter when you study this poem, A Hard Frost, by Cecil Day Lewis. So the first question that someone's going to ask you, or the first question you might encounter in a test or an exam, is what does the word hard tell us about this frost? Well, a hard frost, as we've already said, is a severe form of frost, and it suggests that things are frozen solid. In your own words, can you explain the poet's feelings towards the early morning frost? And let's have a look at some supporting extracts from the text. So the image of spring has been created through a mirage of frost. Now immediately you can see that the poem makes that look like it's real. And so you can tell that the poet doesn't trust, doesn't like, doesn't believe what the frost is showing. And he uses words mockery spring. So although it looks beautiful like spring, he knows that the whole thing is a mockery. So there's a disapproving approach. Question number three. Discuss the bridal image in this poem. Now, the ordinary countryside is being portrayed as a simple country maid that is being lent a bridal gown with all its jewels and ribbons and so on. Now you can imagine a farm worker who's working hard, who looks tired, and here she is being given a beautiful, beautiful gown. Only for the ice to melt and she's left like someone jilted at the altar and left exactly as she was before. Now, this image is effective as it reinforces the transitory and the temporary nature of the beauty which the frost gives to the landscape. So let's have a look at two phrases which indicate that the poet is looking at something that he believes to be de defective and deceptive. So the two phrases in the poem that we're going to extract are mockery spring and look at too brilliant to be true. So we know that if something is too brilliant to be true, then it probably isn't. And that's what the poet is referring to here. Now, here's an interesting question. Refer to the simile in lines 8 and 9. Let me read them to you. Mist that hangs in the valley below. Now, comment on how the simile takes the description of the winter scene to another level. Now let's face it, mist has no definitive or clearly defined shape. And it reminds the poet of the raw material from which matter was made at the dawn of time. And if you've ever watched any of those documentary films about how the world began and how our universe began, there always seems to be some kind of mist that shrouds and hides everything. It has no specific form, no specific shape. Now this imagery and this analogy of this formless mist lifts the poem and its themes from merely being about the frost and it lifts it to a point where it talks about more universal ideas. When it comes to looking at metaphors, stanza two is a good one. Let's have a look at this metaphor in stanza two to lend this bridal gear for a few hours to a raw country maid. 
Now, what it means is that something which is dry, something which looks old, something which is broken down, has been given a bridal gown, has been given something beautiful. And the theme here that, the, that this metaphor is trying to explain is that the beauty formed by the frost is fake. In the same way, the bridal des dress it doesn't make the girl happy because it's only for a moment. It's there, and then a short while later, when, it, when the frost and everything melts, that bridal dress is gone. So by the time we get to the start of stanza two, we can see things are fairly, fairly sad, fairly cynical, fairly negative. But remember, it does end on a positive note. Look at lines 14 to 19, where it starts with, no, not here, all the way through to the last words, future breeze. And what is the poem telling us here? What is the poet trying to convey? That real growth doesn't happen on the surface, which would be the obvious place when you think everything to start growing from the top. But the real growth, the real start, the real origin of change and growth and development starts deep underneath where it's unseen. So the real growth starts underground, where the ice has forced the soil to crack and break open, and so the seeds are now released. And they've been frozen hard, building up through this winter. And what he's trying to say is that hardships in our lives release a new growth inside us, and real change happens invisibly. Good luck, Grade 12s. I know you're going to enjoy this. So go to our site and have a look at even more questions around this amazing poem. Good luck. We need to learn to live with the COVID virus, you know, the new normal, at least for the next few months. And we have just what you need to make sure you never miss a single school lesson. And it's absolutely free. Mahala! High quality, powerful, animated lessons for all your subjects. So don't spend a cent until you have tried IWAS. It's everything you need. All video lessons, textbooks, workbooks, exam prep. We want you to ace 2021.